Kristen, Kristen talked the full time. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> I will, though. I will. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So now we've got the priority of, you know, you being selfish and programming in towards happiness. We know that anatomy and physiology is important. We know that muscle damage is important, mechanical tension, metabolic no, stress. We know all these things are important. Yeah. Now let's... Alright, so I should got thank you. Try to get my Okay, so you guys know me, I'm kind of a nutrition guy. But I'm giving a talk on training today. Now, as all my talks, if you came in here expecting me to give you do this many sets. Oh, laser Okay, it's all point. Good. Periodization is a word that gets thrown around a lot. And I'm pretty convinced that half the people that use the word don't actually know what it means. So, we're going to talk today about different forms of periodization. Are there better ones? Are there worse ones? And how you can apply them to yourself in your training. So, we'll go through the forms of periodization, linear, non-linear, TUP, phases versus reps. Things like auto regulation, training volume, and frequency. Okay, so periodization essentially, this big long thing basically means that you're training for something. Okay, so you're going to, you should be, periodization is you organize your training to peak yourself for something. Okay, the idea that you want to be able to predict that you're going to be at your best for whatever, a bodybuilding show, uh, a powerlifting meet, an Olympic weightlifting meet, a CrossFit, whatever it may be, is you want to be able to peak yourself for that, to have a predictable form of training that you can organize it, and we're talking about for the week, for the month, and for the year, okay? And those are called micro, meso, and macro cycles, and we'll talk about each of those. Beginners do not need to periodize. First thing, you don't need to. If you just started weightlifting, which is probably not apply to most of you, but if you have, if you, how many trainers we got out here? Okay, we got a lot of trainers. If somebody comes into you for, don't worry about periodization. They're gonna have such a robust response to just lifting weights. Worry about teaching them proper form. Okay, that's number one. Enough volume and frequency that they practice the skill of the lifts. Okay? And this may be counterintuitive to many people. Don't overuse failure. Okay, if you overuse failure training, you make them too sore, they cannot effectively execute the workout. Contrary to popular belief, soreness does not produce muscle growth. If you want to be sore, go run a marathon. I'm serious. You'll be really sore. You guys think you grew muscle from that? No, right? So intuitively, so now soreness can be associated with muscle growth and progression, but it is it is not a positive effect. Okay? We're, we're, now once we understand that, we're going to talk about what actually causes muscle growth, strength adaptations, these sorts of things. It's actually it's actually training volume, but we'll we'll get back to that. But in, in beginners, if you if you train them too hard, I mean, remember the last the first time you went in and really hammered it in the gym? How sore were you? You barely walk, right? Yeah. So the problem is, is now if I have somebody who's really sore and I want to teach them a skill, I want to get let's say I like to squat. So let's just say squats, because I always revert back to that. But if I want to teach them how to squat and they're sore for eight days afterwards. They can only train once every eight days, right? But if I can stay a little bit short of failure, maybe they're only sore for three or four days, and then I can get them in, train them some more, get them more skilled at it. Because it, at the end, periodization is important, but 95% of success is work really, really hard for a really, really long time. That's it, okay? Periodization's lost 5%. Most people fail, in training or bodybuilding or whatever it is, not because they didn't have some super secret workout, not because they didn't have the right diet, but because they get discouraged and they take three months off or six months off or whatever. Show me one person who worked really friggin' hard for 10 years and wasn't pretty good at what they're doing. 
good luck finding that person. If you work really hard for a really long time, you're going to be pretty good at what you're doing, even with subpar genetics. Okay? So now that we understand that, we can take it to the next level. You want enough training volume in a beginner to teach them the skill, to get them some adaptation, so that they start adapting to the workloads and they get some muscle growth, they get some strength, without overreaching them. You don't want to overtrain a beginner, okay? Over, overreaching, which is different than overtraining, by the way, overreaching is actually something that's useful, and we'll talk about that. But overtraining, a chronic thing, is something you want to avoid. Which, by the way, overtraining doesn't happen, happen nearly as often as everybody says it does. Like, if you ever go to a bodybuilding message board, dangerous thing, I know. But if you put down your workout and you're not, you say you're not making progress, the first comment, you're, you're overtraining. I, I'm training legs like once every 10 days. That's overtraining. Okay, show me one thing where you, you do it less and you get better at it. No. Okay, so the first form of periodization that ever came up was called linear periodization. All right? Now, when we talk about periodization versus unperiodized programming, unperiodized is basically, ah, bro, I'm going in, I'm doing three sets of 10, or three sets of 12, or whatever rep range you want. And you always use that rep range, you don't change it, okay? Periodization is variety, it's changing things, okay? So linear periodization would be, for example, we're changing the rep ranges in the mesocycle. The mesocycle is like four to eight weeks of training, okay? So for example, if we were doing four week blocks of training, maybe weeks one through four we do three sets of 15 reps. And then weeks five through eight, four sets of 10. And then weeks nine through 12, six sets of five. Do you guys see what's happening? So we're, we're, we're having variety, right? Okay? So but for four weeks they're staying the same, but every four week block they change, okay? This, in intermediates and advanced, is more effective than non-periodized, okay? You get better strength, better hypertrophy. Why? Because you have increased variety, right? There's certain benefits to this rep range that you don't get here. And there's certain benefits here that you don't get here. Is that, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So you're getting the benefits of both by doing that. Now, you guys can still hear me okay, right? But I can hardly hear myself just it's so loud. So, now, I know people are thinking, why are the sets going up? Right? So the sets are increasing. It's because since your reps are going down, I'm taking the sets up because you want to keep about the volume the same or going up. Okay, so that's why the sets are going up. But the one downside to linear periodization is after, when I'm down here, when I'm in my 12th week doing sets of five, it's been eight weeks since I've been doing sets of 15. So some of those adaptations that are favorable for that higher rep range, I have, I have lost by here. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So now, that being said, one quick thing I want to point out, 15, 10, 5 is not a magic rep range, okay? You can do 10, 8, 6, or 20, 15, 10. But you can, you can do it however you want. And we'll talk about, so for example, the law of specificity applies. If you're a power lifter, it probably doesn't make sense to spend a bunch of time in this zone, right? You're still going to use higher rep ranges because there's benefits, but you're probably going to spend more time in this zone, right? In that strength-based zone, right? If you're a bodybuilder, it may be the opposite. You may spend more time doing higher volume, less time doing strength-based stuff, okay? So it's specific. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's pretty easy. All right. Nonlinear periodization. So we're going to undulate the rep ranges within the micro cycle. Okay? So if we take the same undulation pattern we had before, 15, 10 reps, 5 reps, here's how we would do a nonlinear periodized program. Week one, day one, let's say we're having training. Okay, let's say we're talking about squat, because again, I'm a bias towards the squat, all right? So before we were doing, you know, the undulation pattern within the, within the mesocycle, 
let's say we have a squat frequency of two times a week, okay? We can do it like day one, three sets of 15 reps. Day two, week one, four sets of 10. Week two, day one, six sets of five. Do you guys see what I'm doing here? It's the same undulation pattern, but it's happening faster, okay? So now what you're getting is you're getting the benefits of this and this, but you're keeping the adaptation, okay? Because you're doing it, you're doing each one more frequently. And what else is the difference? More variety, right? So even though linear periodization has variety, because you're changing it each piezo cycle, non-linear has more variety, right? Because you're changing workout to workout. Does that make sense? Okay. I know it's early, does everybody have their coffee in? I see Simon's got his, so I know he's good. So then you could just repeat it. So week one, day one, week one, day two. You see, I'm just repeating throughout, okay? Daily undulating periodization. This is where you are changing the rep schemes daily. It's really not that much different than nonlinear periodization. They're kind of both different sides of the same coin. But I'll give you an example of this. If we had a squat frequency of three times per week, like me, or four, so the repetitions are going to change from day to day, okay? So an example would be day one, three sets of 15, day two, four sets of 10, day three, six sets of five. And I'm not talking about three days in a row necessarily. Although, by the way, did you know you can do the same lift two days in a row and your, your, your body won't explode? You can actually do that. I know it's, it's crazy. It's blasphemy. People out there will say I'm crazy. But I squatted four days a week for worlds. Didn't die. Got stronger and my legs hypertrophied amazingly. So, again, it's just more variety, right? So it seems. Now, do, do you guys familiar with my friend Dr. Mike Zordos? You might have heard me talk about him before. Right, so uh, Dr. Zordos, he talks about this sort of stuff because I don't want you to get the impression that this is the only way to do this. It's not, okay? Dr. Zordos did a, did a periodization study, and I'll talk about it later, but he showed one form of daily undulating periodization be better than another form, right? And what he said was, listen, don't think that this is the only way to do this. This might be the second worst form of periodization out there. It was just better than this one. Okay, now we don't, we don't think it's the second worst form, but it's important to keep that in mind, all right? All this stuff is very malleable. It's very, you can change it. This can be 1086, 642, 963. Like the rep ranges can change however you want, okay? That's what's great about it. That's what's also confusing about it, but I'm, like I said, I'm gonna give you guys some concepts to work with. Okay. In addition to altering the rep ranges, we can also do what's called a phases undulation. Okay, so if we have the three phases are, for example, um, hypertrophy, strength, and power. Okay, so hypertrophy is like your typical 8 to 12 rep range, 8 to 15 rep range, that sort of thing, which is kind of a misnomer because you can get hypertrophy from low reps and from really high reps too. But just for the sake of simplicity, we'll say like 8 to 15 reps is your traditional hypertrophy range, okay? And your strength range is 1 to 5, and then power would be like lightweight, 50 to 60% of a 1 rep max for 2 to 5 reps for speed, okay, going as fast as you can. So you can do, a this is actually the traditional VDUP. This is the traditional setup, okay? You do hypertrophy, strength, power, days one through three, okay? Does that make sense? So you're undulating the type of training you do. But I usually ask this question, but it's so loud out here, nobody will be able to answer me. Besides, these two probably won't know the answer anyway, so I'm not gonna let them cheat. <laughs> But Dr. Zordos thought that maybe this might not be optimal for periodization. And the reason being, if I do a hypertrophy day, high volume, a lot of reps, I'm probably gonna be pretty sore after that, right? Like quite a bit of muscle damage, that sort of thing. So does it make sense for my next workout to be straight where I've really gotta test myself maximally? So what they did, They tested the traditional setup, which is hypertrophy strength power, HSP, but 
versus a different setup, hypertrophy power strength. The idea being, if we're very sore after a hypertrophy workout, maybe it's difficult to do a strength workout, but a power workout is still doable. Right? I can still do 50, 60% of my one rep max for low reps for speed. Right? That's not going to be too terribly taxing. And I get the benefits, it's an active recovery, and by the time the strength day comes back around, hopefully I'll recover. So they set it up, hypertrophy power strength, and they found that they were able to get on their test day more reps, perform better, and they had a higher training volume. Okay? So we think that this may be better. But as he said, that doesn't mean that this is better. Or it doesn't mean it's the best thing ever. It just means it's better than that one. <laughs> it could be the second worst one. <laughs> we don't think so. But. Now that being said, if so right now we have a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one ratio of hypertrophy power strength, right? But if I'm, a, if I'm a bodybuilder, if my goal is complete hypertrophy, and I only care about strength, not for the sake of strength, but just for the sake of creating more hypertrophy, maybe it makes more sense to have it more heavily weighted towards hypertrophy. Maybe instead of doing one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, I do two-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. Okay? So maybe I would go, Hypertrophy, power, hypertrophy, strength, hypertrophy, power, hypertrophy, strength. Does that make sense? Now maybe now you can take that pretty far. You can say, what about three to one to one, four to one? We don't know. Okay, these are all concepts. I would tend to say that I would favor a sort of style of a two to one to one. I think that's a good mix of variety with still being specific. Now if you're a power lifter, maybe you want to go two to one to one, strength, hypertrophy, power. If you're an Olympic athlete, maybe you want to go more power, okay? So, all these things are completely malleable and can change and should be made specific for what you want to do. Okay, so let's just go through the different forms, their advantages and disadvantages, all right? Especially for you trainers out there, this is important to know. If we're, if we're talking about beginners, again, don't need to periodize. At least the first 16 weeks, don't even worry about it, all right? Just get them skilled at the lift, get them confident, and here's how about this idea. Do something they enjoy. If they like it, they're probably more likely to come back, right? If somebody hates to squat... What? If I'm a coach, <laughs> now I'm what, yeah, exactly. Now, I don't know if these people actually exist, you know? But if they do, uh, first off, I'm gonna take them to the Church of Squat, and I'm gonna try to convince them why squats are wonderful and can cure everything from cancer to, you know, bone aches. <laughs> <and things. laughs> but, but if somebody really hates to do an exercise, why am I gonna try and force them to do that? If they don't like it, they're not gonna work hard on it. This is, this is that's another thing about, for those of you who come to my talk tomorrow, I'll talk about this. But now, you may not enjoy certain workouts, but overall, your training experience should be fun. If it's not fun, you're not going to work hard at it, and you're not going to do it, okay? If you hate it, you're just not going to do it, or you're not going to be into it. So overall, it should be fun. So I can tell you all the stuff you want to know, but if you hate doing stuff a certain way, don't do it that way, okay? All right, so now, again, getting down to that last 5%, the nitty gritty, if we're talking about intermediate or advanced people, daily undulating periodization seems to be superior to nonlinear periodization. Okay? But, oh, I'm sorry. An advanced linear periodization, especially for you trainers out there, it's easier to program. Okay? And it's easier for the average person to understand. Right? Some people start getting confused, like, okay, I did, I did 15 reps today, what am I supposed to do? So you're changing it all the time, so it's a little bit harder to, to follow. But if you know, okay, I'm just doing this for four weeks, doing this for the next four weeks, doing this for the next, it's a little bit easier to do, okay? So for beginners or intermediates, linear periodization probably makes more sense, just in terms of ease of programming. Now, real quick, I want to cover this class. Has anybody ever heard of auto-regulation? Have ever heard of this concept? Okay, it's pretty cool. So auto-regulation, this originally originated, I think originated in Bulgaria or Russia, one of those places where they grow strong people. And it's the idea that, you know what, you're not always going to be your best 
You're not always going to be as good as you are at your best day, and you're not going to usually be as bad as you are at your worst day. Okay? You understand that? Like some days you go in the gym and you just don't have it. Right? Okay. Well, and some days you go in the gym and you feel like a freaking god. Right? Like you feel like you can crush anything in there. Well, maybe it makes sense to use that to our advantage. Right? So, you can use auto regulation within the workout, within the week, and within the training block. The, the way I like to do auto regulation, anybody know who Mike Tushir is? Have you ever heard of him? Of course you guys have. <laughs> Mike is a really, really, really good powerlifter in the States. And he bases almost all his training on auto regulation. I think for most people that's difficult. If you have to tell somebody, for example, he uses what's called the RPE scale, which is rate of perceived exertion. And his training will be, okay, today I'm going to go and I'm going to do three sets of five at an RPE of eight. An RPE of eight would simply mean that I'm leaving two reps in the tank. RPE 10 is no reps left to failure. Make sense? Okay. But RPE 8, people will perceive it differently. Okay? Every day I go into warm up, I'm a slow squatter. If you look at my squats, like I squat 500 pounds slower than everybody else who's in the top five in nationals. But I still squat more than everybody else. Okay? My rate of perceived exertion is just higher because I'm a bigger brighter. So I can warm up with 500. I can do a 500 for probably around 13, 14 reps. But my RPE, does that mean my RPE is like a negative four? So there's limitations to that scale. Does that make sense? And how you perceive it. So if I'm warming up and 500 is just really slow because I'm not into it, does that mean my RPE is really high? Or does it mean I'm just not into it? It's hard for me to judge. So I think for people who are very analytical, like Mike, Mike is very, very analytical. He can kind of separate his emotions from the workout. Different than most of us. If most of us are warming up and it feels bad, we go, ah, ah. I just ask my workout partners, Lauren and Paul, they have to like smack me and be like, wait, shut up, you'll be fine. You do this every time. So where I really think auto-regulation can be beneficial is within the week, okay? So let's say, let's say I have two squat sessions a week. I'm doing a heavy day and a lighter day. So I have my strength day and my hypertrophy day, okay? If I go in on my strength day, it's supposed to be my strength day, and I feel like garbage, why not just do the lighter day that day? And do the strength day later in the week? Because the probability is, the problem what you'll find, if you've been working out long enough, if you feel really bad one day, you know what the likelihood is? You're gonna be really feeling really good the other day, right? And if you feel really good one day, the likelihood is you're gonna feel like crap coming up. Yeah. Okay, so it happens, it goes in the waves. In fact, one of the problems with being too heavy in auto-regulation is let's say I feel really good one day, and I auto-regulate that, and I do more than I thought I was, than I, should, than I had originally programmed. It really increases the likelihood that the next day I'm gonna feel like crap. And so if I feel like crap that next day, if I auto-regulate, I'm gonna do even less than I programmed on that day. So what happens is you start to have bigger gaps in how your training is going. Does that make sense? I think auto-regulation can be useful, but I think we have to temper how much we use it. But I do think using it within the week makes a lot of sense, okay? So if you have a heavier session, or if you, not even heavier, but if one of the week, like let's say you feel like heavy workouts are kind of easy, but your high volume stuff is what kills you. Okay, we'll do the high volume stuff on days you, on days you feel better. Does that make sense? Hopefully not just like, talking to myself without making sense. <laughs> so, another way of doing auto-regulation is what's called conservative maxing. Now this is a very, very, very advanced technique. The Bulgarians use this a lot. So what they'll do is they literally have them go in and work up to what's called a training max every session. A training max is much, much different than a competition max. A training max is literally Okay, I'm going to walk up to the bar and do it. I'm not getting jacked up. I'm not snorting a bunch of, you know, uh, so now get your minds out of the gutter. <laughs> ammonia. I'm not snorting a bunch of ammonia. I'm not, you know, getting a bunch of caffeine to do this. I'm just, it's just whatever I can walk up, put in the bar and do that day confidently. Does that make sense? So on days I feel really good, my conservative max is going to be higher. And I can program off that. So maybe I come in, so let's say I want to do 80% of, of my conservative max for five reps, okay? 
If I come in one day and I squat 620, I feel really good. My training weights are going to be higher than if I come in and just do 580. Does that make sense? So now your 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 training automatically becomes programmed to what you can do. Now, I don't think doing conservative maxing every workout is a good idea for most people. It beats you up. I do think what you can do is for trainers out there, if you have a little bit of money to spend, has anybody ever heard of a tendo unit? A tendo unit. So a tendo unit is something you attach to the bar, it doesn't have any weight, and it measures the velocity of the bar. Okay? So what you can do is as you if you keep notes on clients or notes on yourself, you can know on a good day how fast your bar velocity is with a certain weight. Does that make sense? So if I know, okay, with 500 pounds, my bar velocity should be a 0.3. And I go in and it's a 0.35, I can go, oh, I got it today, right? I can be a little more aggressive. But if I come in and it's a 0.21, I go, eh, maybe today's not the day to really push it. Does that make sense? There's even apps out there right now that can estimate bar velocity for you. A really good one for iPhone is called Iron Pack. I would check that out. It's free, actually. You can check it out. I think it's free. It is. What, but what I use the most for auto regulation is what we call AMRAP or plus sets. Okay? So, for example, what I'll do is once a week on my heaviest squat day, my last set, let's say I'm doing 85% of a one rep max for sets of four. Okay? I'm doing, I'm doing five sets of four. On my last set, I'll do as many as I can get, okay? And so what happens is, let's say I go in and I freaking crush it. I get like nine reps, okay? Then that means, that, that weight is probably less than 85% of my max, right? Because I got so many reps for it. So maybe next week what I'll do is I'll program for that by making a bigger increase than I had planned, okay? Maybe I'll add 10 kilos or, or seven and a half kilos, something like that. But if I go in and I only get four or five reps, and it's really hard, maybe I'll just keep the weight the same and it won't change anything. Does that make sense? So if you're performing better, it doesn't make sense to not make it more difficult for yourself. But if you're not performing better, it doesn't make sense to, for example, my friend Paul, he was doing a squat program, and I was watching his squats. And he's like, yeah, next week I'm jumping 20 pounds. And in my mind, I'm like, oh. <laughs> don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> but, you know, and it wasn't a good idea, but something we learned over the time. So all these are things you can use. And these, all these things are not mutually exclusive, right? You can do DUP with auto-regulation. You can do linear periodization with auto-regulation. All this stuff you can use. Okay, I want to take a minute to talk about the role of volume and frequency in training. All right. So a lot of people will tell you that it's the pump is what makes muscle grow, or it's it's muscle damage, or it's metabolic byproduct accumulation, or it's this stuff. All that stuff matters. It does matter. But volume is your biggest driver of hypertrophy and strength. It, it, if you look at the literature, it's 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 pretty conclusive. You will argue with me on this, but they're wrong. Okay? Sorry, they're wrong. Or at least, I have a high degree of confidence that they are wrong, okay? <laughs> so, that doesn't, again, people will say, wait, okay, well why don't I just take the bar and just squat the bar 5,000 times? Believe it or not, you're going to get a hypertrophy from that. But you're taking it and you're taking it to the extreme. Just stop, right? Like I can make anything sound stupid if I take it to the extreme, okay? So failure, metabolic stress, damage, autocrine responses, stretch, all that stuff, all that stuff still matters, okay? It's just that volume matters more than that stuff. Plus, volume is such a, and I'll, I'll get to it, volume is quite simply number of reps you did times the weight times the number of sets. That's it, okay? So if you did 575 with 100 kilos, 2,500 kilograms of volume. Does that make sense? And everybody sitting there saying, no way, this is way too simple. <laughs> but think about what volume entails. Volume encompasses, because it's so general, it encompasses all this stuff, right? Like if you do enough volume, you're getting a lot of tension, you're getting a lot of metabolic stress.
stress. You're getting a lot of this stuff. That's why volume is always the biggest predictor of hypertrophy and strength. Okay. So, just like I'm sure you guys know, I'm a big flexible dieting person, right? So, people like when people tell me they eat well, I'm like, okay, what does that actually mean? Or I eat clean. Okay, well, what does that actually mean? All right. What are you eating? What are you taking in? If you don't know your macronutrient intake, you don't know your calorie intake, you're kind of taking shots in the dark of what you're doing. But once you know it, you can adjust variables and get predictable outcomes. Okay? So I track my training volume. Okay? It's easy. You have an Excel spreadsheet, you have an exercise list on the left side, reps, sets, weight, across the top, just put it in as a calculator. It'll auto-calculate your volumes on everything for you. Okay? Now, you want to track your training volume over time because over time it should be going up. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about where it may go down during certain periods, and that's okay. When I, when I say the training volume should go up over time, I'm talking about the arc of your training career over 15 and 20 and 30 years, okay? I'm not saying I did 2,500 kilograms of squat this day, so tomorrow I've got to do 3,000, and then next day I'll do 30. Because pretty soon you're going to see how that's going to get unmaintainable, right? Like, do I really need 100,000 pounds of 200,000 kilos of squat volume six months into training? Probably not. And actually, I'd probably die. So I won't go through with that. It's critical to progress volume appropriately, okay? Just like I'm gonna take somebody and try to walk their calories up over time to improve their metabolic rate, I'm not just gonna throw 500 calories on there right away. They're gonna gain body fat. If somebody's used to 2,500 kilos of volume on something, I'm not gonna jump them to 5,000 kilos. It doesn't make sense, okay? But here's what's gonna happen. One, they're gonna get injured. Most likely, this is what happened most times, okay? Or two, let's say you take your training volume and you triple it, right? And you don't get injured. You'll make, you'll make, you'll, once you adapt, the first few weeks your strength will go down, but then you'll adapt and your strength will really start going up. But guess what? You will plateau at a certain point. And so now, let's say I take somebody who can squat once a week and I start on four times a week, and they don't get injured. They're gonna progress pretty quickly. They're gonna do really well. What happens once they plateau? Five times a week? Six times a week? Like, you should make progress on the minimal amount of volume that you can, still making progress. Does that make sense? Okay? If you can make, if you're making progress, training everything once a week, you don't have to change that, that's okay. But if you need to go up to twice, do that. But if you're making progress on twice a week, don't go three times a week, right? Progress it appropriately. Right? Like I was saying, when I was getting ready for Worlds, I was squatting four times a week. I've been training 15 years to get to that point. Is anybody familiar with uh, small off? Small off squat routine. Okay, so small off is something people go on it, and it's like three weeks, and they're oh my god, I put 10, 20, 30, 40 kilos on my squat. I've heard that, okay? And people are like, wow, those repetitions and sets are magic, like it's some magic. No, it's not magic. You quadrupled your volume, of course your squat went up. You know? So it's not magic, right? There's no magic rep and set schemes. High reps are useful because you get a lot of volume with a low amount of sets. Does that make sense? All right? Low reps are useful because it's very specific for the skill of strength. Okay? There's certain adaptations to each. In fact, uh, Brad Schoenfeld did a study where they compared three sets of ten reps versus seven sets of three doing the same amount of volume. Okay, they equated for total volume. You guys follow me? Hypertrophy was the same. Even though one was a traditional hypertrophy range and one was a traditional strength range, when they equated the volume, it was the same. But the group doing the seven sets of three actually got stronger. So people go, aha, that's it. That's the magic sets. Seven sets of three, that's what, well hang on. The group that was doing that was more prone to injury and it took them 70 minutes to finish the workout, whereas the group doing three sets of 10 did it for 25 minutes. Okay? So there's unique benefits to both. This is why we this is why I don't this is why I tell people there's no magic rep range. You should use all of them. Okay? Because I'm gonna use high reps in my training. Even though I'm a power lifter, sometimes I body build, sometimes. 
even though I'm primarily a power lifter, I'll still do sets of 10, 12, because I can build a lot of volume in a short period of time doing that. Does that make sense? Right? But I still have to do low reps as well, because that's more specific towards my skill. You guys follow me? Cool, you guys smart class here, I like this. <laughs> So I got ahead of myself. I do this once a time. So we, again, we want to progress volume appropriately. Okay? Have you guys seen the, 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 the program on bodybuilding? And I love bodybuilding.com, so no hate. Uh, the Squat Everyday program on bodybuilding. Have you guys seen this? Yeah, I've been getting tweeted about it a lot. Like, what do you think? What do you think? It's just like when I describe to people with their diets. They'll be like, I'm going on a ketogenic diet. I'm going, I'm cutting bread out. I'm like, okay, so you're never going to eat it again. Ever. Because what the research data says is as soon as you add that stuff back, you just ain't going to regain all that weight you lost. Okay? That's why I talk about sustainability so much. It's the same thing with training. Are you going to squat every day for the rest of your life? I'm not. I love to squat, but I ain't going to do that. Okay? So... It has to be something maintainable. Because you, I mean, if you squat every day, yeah, you'll get, you'll get, if you don't get hurt, you'll get stronger, you'll get way stronger. But then as soon as you go back to twice a week, it's just gonna go right back down to where you were before, okay? So, progress it appropriately, right? Don't, don't. Now, if you're getting, specifically, if you're getting ready for powerlifting meet, if, you, if your squat's kind of lagging behind, maybe it makes sense as a PE protocol for two or three weeks to do that, okay? But not forever. Same same concept. If you're a bodybuilder and you have like, I mean Arnold talked about this. If you have really bad calves or really bad body part, maybe it makes sense for one month before that competition to do a lot of volume every day on the body part. To really try and just get that short-term real big increase in hypertrophy. Is it gonna be maintainable? No. But again, part of periodization is peaking for something, right? Does it make sense? So we're trying to plan increases in volume over a mesocycle, cycle, which is your month or six, eight weeks of training, and also the macro cycle, so over the course of the year, okay? Some blocks of training may decrease in volume, and I'm going I'm to show you guys, don't worry, I'm actually going to show you guys an example. I'm sure everybody's like, right now. Yeah, all this stuff's great, like, the science is great. Sh show us the DUP, like, show us, what is it? So again, even though training volume may go like this, okay, over the course of our training career, it should do this, right? Overall, it should be going up. All right, so, just because I get to pick, because I'm giving a talk, I get to pick. Let's say we have a power lifter who wants to get ready for a meet, okay? And, then, and I'll give you, don't worry, all you bodybuilders out there, I'll give you an example of how to do this for body too, okay? Let's say the meet is uh, 12 weeks away, all right? And right now they have a squat frequency of three times a week, bench frequency of three times a week, and deadlift frequency of twice a week, okay? So we can set it up like this, for example. So our undulation pattern for squat and bench, we'll do 10, 8, 6, okay? And deadlift, 8, 5, okay? And then you see here, these are percentages of one rep max. Okay, are you guys following me here? All right. So we're not going higher than eighty percent. Now, why? Are, this is part of person to power lifter. This is actually kind of bodybuilding rep ranges almost. Okay. They're pretty far out from meat. Their meat's not coming up right away. We're trying to build training volume. We're trying to make more adaptation. Okay. The meat's far enough away. We can build more volume and focus on just getting the training volume. In. And also, it's going to beat them up less than doing a bunch of sets of heavy reps or heavy weights. And then here, this little plus, this means the last set on this day is going to be an AMRAP, as many reps as they can get. So it's their kind of test, their mini test thing, okay? Plus, I'll talk about it real quick. Failure, failure is a useful tool, and most people use it completely inappropriately, okay? For example, if my, if my squat max for 10 reps is 300 pounds, right, you guys understand pounds over here, right? If I say pounds, you guys, okay, all right. I always, when I go to other countries, I always mess this up. But let's say it's 300 pounds. 
and you do it for 10 reps, and that's as much as you can get, that's it. You do that in your first set. How many reps can you do 300 pounds for in your next set? Maybe like four or five, right? Because you're so wiped out. And then if you do the next set, what are you gonna get? Like one or two? So you can see pretty quickly, like it's gonna be really hard to get your training volume in if you're taking that first set completely to failure. Does that make sense? So why not stay a couple reps short of failure, get some sets in, build that training volume, and then take it to failure on the last set. Does that make sense? Now you're getting the benefits of volume and training to failure, okay? And by, by the way, the whole, the muscle doesn't grow unless it's taken to failure, no. That, I, I will say, I, that's not just me, you're wrong. <laughs> you don't have to train to failure to get muscle growth. Yep. Now again, it's a useful tool, but it's just a tool. It's not a requirement. All right, so this is our four, four, first four weeks of training. Now, after we finish that training block, let's say we set it up like this for the next four weeks of training. Check it out. See the reps are going down. So now we're doing, instead of 10, 8, 6, we're doing 8, 6, 4. You guys follow me? And the percentages are going up. And the sets are going up. Since the reps are going, are going down, we have to do more sets to get the training volume in. Make sense? Okay. So still keeping up with the frequency, all that sort of stuff. Then for the last four weeks before the meet, as they're peaking for me, and again, I'm not saying that this is right for you, the college is out there, but just a concept. Again, the reps are going down, the sets are going up, the intensity is going up. So what's happening? As their contest approaches, they're getting more specific for what they want to do, which is a one rep max, okay? When I was getting ready for Worlds, my coach, Ben Esco, we started incorporating two times a week conservative squat maxing. Now, I'm pretty advanced, okay? So I, I was able to do that. But conservative maxing was useful for me because it's so specific for what I want to do, right? Now, if this person's a bodybuilder, this doesn't make much sense before a bodybuilding show, does it? To be going in and doing sets of two. In fact, for a bodybuilder or a physique athlete, we might actually reverse this. In their off-season, maybe we're focusing on more really strength-based stuff, okay? We're gonna build a strength base. Because when we go to volume training, as their contest approaches, they're gonna be stronger, they can lift more weight in that hypertrophy range. Does that make sense? So this is why strength is still useful for people who are only concerned with hypertrophy. Because if you're stronger, you can lift more weights in that higher rep range, create more overload, create more growth, okay? Hyper By the way, powerlifters, hypertrophy rep ranges, still important for powerlifting too. Again, variety is important. If you guys understand a little more about this concept of specificity, specificity matters, okay? Now, here is a four week training period, right? And so far I'm just showing the set numbers being the same every week, okay? Well, it doesn't have to be the case. I'm doing this for the sake of simplicity, okay? Let, so for example, let's say on their plus sets, it's supposed to be 90% of the one rep max, and on their plus set, they get like six or seven reps. And yeah, that's not 90% of the one rep max, right? They've gotten stronger, right? Make sense? So maybe what we can do is we can increase the weight next week, or we can add more sets, right? You can do either way, right? We've done it both ways in my training, right? So I've had it before where I'm performing well, but I feel really freaking beat up. So Ben's like, all right, well, let's just add another set instead of making you do more weight, okay? Or we've done it where I'm crushing it and I feel pretty good. He's like, all right, here's 10 more kilos. Let's see if you still look. <laughs> so all this stuff, again, these are concepts. You can incorporate this however you want. Now let's talk about some myths here, all right? These aren't workouts. These aren't programs. These are systems of programming. Do you understand the difference? Just the same way that flexible dieting is not a diet, okay? 
that make sense? I saw that the other day. Uh, somebody was criticizing IIFYM and flexible dieting, and they called it the IIFYM diet. And I'm like, pretty sure you have no idea what it actually is. Like, it's just a system of tracking. That's it. Like, you know, you can still eat clean and do IIFYM. Like, it's not mutually exclusive. So, you can do, like, did you notice when we were doing our daily undulating periodization, how the different blocks had different rep ranges, right? So, there's an element of linear periodization there still. Does that make sense? So, you're incorporating both. And we're having plus sets. So, incorporating auto regulation. Nothing is mutually exclusive. The world is your oyster. That's <laughs> the other one I get. Because a lot of people who've incorporated DUP or powerlifters for squat, bench, press, and deadlift. I've gotten laid. I, I can't do DUP. I, I can't squat. I got bad knees. Okay, well, DUP doesn't mean squat. You can do DUP for reverse grip feature curl. Okay? Now, I've had people take it to the extreme. Like, can I do DUP for wrist curls? I'm like, yeah, I guess you could. You know, I mean, you can. You know? You can periodize anything. Anything you want. Okay? If you hate back squat and you want to do front squats, fine. You can periodize that. No problem. Do that. Absolutely. Right? That's what I recommend. If, you're, if you get better results in back squat for quad growth, and that's a weak point for you, periodize that. Okay? There's no reason you have to use squat and press and deadlift. I just use them because, well, I'm giving the talk and I do this. And it's a little bit simple to understand in that context. Volume and frequency are going to be determined by training status. Okay? So for you trainers out there, the first thing I do if I get somebody new is I'm like, all right, let me see your, your current workout program. I'm not going to be like, all right, you look like a strong fella. Let's squat four times a week at 30,000 pounds of volume. I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, maybe it is, maybe for them it's a good idea, but I don't know, right? Just like I'm not gonna take somebody that I know nothing about and say, here, here's your diet. It may work, it probably won't, right? Like, I'm just throwing arrows in the dark, blindfold. I'm gonna have them, for a diet, I'm gonna have them track. I wanna see how many calories they're taking in. I wanna see what the protein intake is. I wanna see what the carbon fat intake is. And then, I'm gonna make adjustments based on fat. Does that make sense? So I'm going to do the same thing in training volume and frequency. They come to me and they're used to squatting once a week. Maybe I'll take them up to twice a week if I feel they can tolerate it. Okay? And they've been squatting twice a week. They're making really good results on that or whatever it is. We'll keep it at that. Maybe we'll organize it a little bit better, you know? But there's no, you know, sometimes as trainers, we feel like we have to give people like these, these magic, you know, these magic protocols and these magic, but there's no magic rep ranges, there's no magic sets, there's no magic diet. Like I, I just got up here and told you, 95% of this is just work really, really hard for a really long time. Okay? Now that 5% can matter, especially if you're competitive. Okay? But for, for just looking good, I'm like, just do what you enjoy and do it for a really long period of time. Okay? Like I said, most people fail because of attrition, not because they didn't have the right workout program. You do it for 10 years, you can do a lot of stuff wrong. If you work really hard for 10 years, you're probably not going to suck at it. Okay? If I just go in and I want to do a degree in something, and I study really hard for 10 years, if I study the wrong ways, I'm probably still going to know quite a bit about that stuff, right? If I go out, I did not know a damn thing about golf. If I just go out and swing a club for 10 years every day, I'm probably just by through trial and error going to get pretty good at it, right? Like I might never be a PGA pro, but I get pretty good at it, right? Consistency matters more than anything. And I know I've got a fancy degree and you guys want me to give you like the magic solution and, and here I am telling you, just go into work hard. But it's so much of it, so much of it. But, again, for the last 5 to 10%, stuff like this can matter, okay? Progress appropriately, all right? We always want to get ahead of ourselves. We want results five years ago, <laughs> right? When I, was, when I was 17 years old, 
I, I'm like in the gym curling every day. Because I'm like, come on. I just want some 16 inch guns. I just want some 16 inch guns. You know what I mean? I'm in there just curling every single day, just trying to get bigger. <laughs> you know, and I, I did fine. You know? If I could go back and tell myself anything back then, it'd be like, dude, calm down. <laughs> calm down, you're going to be fine. You know? But I understand, I understand. But this is a slow, you know, we live, our society, we live in a, um, we get stuff very quickly. We get information very quickly, right? Like, think about, there's more technology in my iPhone 6 right now than there was in like a computer five years ago, right? But if this thing doesn't pull up the internet when I press it in two seconds, I'm like, this piece of crap, you know? <laughs> So we get very, we've gotten very spoiled with how fast we can get stuff these days, right? Well, guess what? You're still dealing with genetics that have been formulated over millions of years, right? So it's not going to happen fast. I get this all the time. People will go, yeah, you know, I, I don't have real, I had a guy email me for training. So I don't have real lofty expectations. I just, I'd really like to add 10 pounds of stage weight this year. Oh, that's it. Market and look at 10 pounds of beef. That is a hell of a lot of tissue. That's a, think about how long it takes your body to make that much tissue. Like, dude, if you put on two pounds of lean body mass in a year, that's awesome. You know? Do it for a long time, do it consistently. That's what makes the difference. Alright? Alright. We have quite a bit of time. Um, I don't know how well I'll be able to hear you guys, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Anybody brave? <laughs> well, I'll just so I'll just keep talking then, since we have a little bit. One thing I'll, I'll talk about, just in general, and I, I do this a lot. I, I've done a lot of research and stuff. I, you know, done really well in competitions. I had a successful career, and none of that is the reason why you should listen to me. Or anybody for that matter. It doesn't matter. You should listen to me because I'm giving you evidence, right? So I'm trying to give you guys general advice on how to sniff out bullshit, basically. Um, I talked to, to Steffi and some other people who came to our camp yesterday. An easy way to know if somebody's an expert is the number of times they say, I don't know. Somebody who says, I don't know, or says, that's not my field, or that's not my, they're, I'm actually more likely to trust that person, okay? There's a lot of people in the fitness industry out there, if you ask them a question, doesn't matter what it is, you get an answer. If you always get an answer, they're full of crap, okay? I'm an, I'm an expert about like this little corner of the universe right here. Like this is, this is where I'm comfortable, okay? In fact, I didn't even want to give a talk on training. I called Mike Zordos and I called Ben and I was like, do you think it's okay if I give a talk on training? Because it's not, you know, my, they're like, playing, yeah, you're fine, you know? But I felt weird about giving a talk on training because my PhD is in nutrition, okay? So I, I see this all the time. Like, you know, I'm not dogging on any one field, but your, your doctor, your physician you go to, he didn't have any classes in nutrition. At the most, he had one. You shouldn't be qualified to speak about it, all right? Like Dr. Oz, you guys have him over here? You guys get him? Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> off, off. But even about, I'll get this too, people will say, you know, I just get so frustrated because one study says this and one study says that, I just, you know, I don't even pay attention to science because then it just contradicts itself. Well, one, the problem is, is usually you're reading that from news articles where they're generalizing the results. Okay, you actually go in and read the study, you interpret it, you find that the differences in the experiment usually explain the differences. But even then, scientists don't always agree. We don't always agree. I have friends, my PhD advisor, Don Lehman, I think he's one of the smartest people in the world. I don't agree with him on everything. Okay? We have various levels of confidence in science. Okay? My good friend, Dr. Jeremy Lenicky, always says, there's data that I've been willing to put my toe on, my foot on, my leg on, and my life on, right? So like, this periodization stuff, I feel pretty good about it. I, I bet like, 
Maybe not quite a leg, but like my lower leg. Like I bet that. But like for example, you, did you know you can never prove anything in science? You can't prove it. Okay? You can't prove it. Now there are some things that are so have such an overwhelming amount of data, we accept them as true. Does that make sense? So gravity. It worked again. Right? Like <laughs> I <can't. laughs> that was the that was the that was the wormhole opening. <laughs> um, you know, I can't prove that I can't prove gravity. Okay? But I have a high degree of confidence that if I drop this, it's gonna rush towards the earth at 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? We just have such enough data that we accept that as true. But in another universe, that might not the laws of physics might not even hold up. Okay? Like it's just so important to understand that, that just because scientists disagree doesn't mean one of, make one of them a scumbag or one of them wrong or, or make them a bad person or stupid, even. Some of this stuff, when I give presentations, I am invariably going to be wrong about some of this stuff. I am going to try to get it as right as I possibly can. All right? And I always tell people, I love to be right. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you I don't like to be right. I love to be right. And every once in a while I like to rub people's faces in it too. Okay? But I care more, I care more about getting the right answer than I do about being right. Okay? That's what we should all care most about. At the end of the day, because I tell people I'm like, I compete. So I want to know what's right. For me, if something doesn't work, I'm not gonna keep doing it just because I said it. Like if it doesn't work best, I'm gonna stop doing it, right? You know what I mean? Like don't become dogmatic about stuff. Don't become dogmatic. Don't be a zealot. I get a lot of zealots who attack me online. Whether it's intermittent fasting or vegans or whatever have you. You know? Because I'm 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 not a zealot. Like I think to myself. You know? And like I said, I'm probably gonna be wrong about some stuff, but I'm always trying to try to get as right for you guys as I can. But you should never just take anything I say and be like, oh, oh, late said it, so that's it. No, I'm, I'm a human being like anybody else. You know, Einstein, uh, uh, now, for those of you, there's probably one troll out here somewhere, so I'm not, wherever you are, I'm not comparing myself to Einstein, all right? So, so I'm just using this as an example. Einstein was wrong about more of his stuff than he was right. He was wrong about more of it than he Anybody think Einstein's an idiot? No, a lot of his stuff is wrong, but he changed the entire field of physics and how we view the universe. Because the concepts he brought up were so useful, they got other people thinking who ended up getting it right. Okay? So ideas are important. Not, you should still value science. You should still value evidence, even when it seems like some stuff contradicts. Don't just automatically dismiss something. Try to figure out why maybe something contradicts something else. Okay, that's my big, that's my big time. So I hope this stuff is useful for you guys. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I am going to be at the MXP booth here in a little bit. Uh, I would say I'll be over there in 15 minutes or so. Uh, come on over, get a picture, get some, get some, get some bio lane shirts, uh, get an autograph, whatever you want. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it.